actually, he said, you know, the vice president of public relations at the TMA, that's sort of a fancy word. I, I'm a lobbyist. I, I actually head up the lobby division of the Texas Medical Association. We represent 45,000 members. I have one of my council on legislation members, Dr. Watson, who presented earlier. Uh, so I uh, feel a little bit of duress uh, talking to one of my uh, council members. Uh, it concerned me when Dr. Buxton mentioned the Burnett feed store supplying our lunch. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I understand it's a great place. Um, I'm going to reserve the, the right to change up my presentation a little bit, uh, as uh, politicians are prone to do. And you know, my mom was a fifth grade school teacher, my dad was a football coach out in West Texas, and so I'd like to draw upon sort of their experience, and we're going to start off with a little Q&A about uh, the political process. You know, I do both state and federal advocacy for the Texas Medical Association, so I had a couple questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, I have a master's in public affairs from the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and we had somebody, you know, my first day that came and talked about the Texas legislature and asked a number of questions, and I will tell you right now, I was 0 for 3 in the questions. So uh, I'm going to ask you all the same questions, uh, see what you all know about the state legislature. We'll also mention Congress in the mix, see how much you all know about Congress. But don't, don't be afraid uh, to raise your hand even if you don't get the right answer. Uh, I, I'm hoping that at the end of the presentation, you'll know more about the political process than you did coming into it. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, who represents uh, the, you and the Texas legislature and how many members of the Texas legislature are there? We'll start in the Texas House. Does anybody know how many Texas House members we have? We have a hundred, we have a hundred, I heard the number, we have 150 House members. In the, Texas, in the Texas House. Uh, and it basically, they operate as a body unto themselves. They elect one of their own to serve as speaker. The speaker appoints committee, uh, committee chairs, has a calendar committee. Basically, that's, the process works over there through those 150 members and the speaker. Uh, the calendar committee sort of sets, you know, the, the bills that go to the House floor. The bills are referred to committee. Uh, the committee chairs of those committees basically determine what bills go on the calendar where they receive a hearing. You know, people like us go and testify on the bills, either in favor of them or in opposition to them, or saying they need to be changed. Then the bills go to a calendars committee uh, and then go back, back to the House floor where they're up for second reading, and then they're done that day, and potential changes, you can amend the bill on the floor, and then it goes to third reading, and then it goes over to the sister chamber on the east end of the Capitol, which is the Texas Senate. Do it, does anybody know how many Texas senators we have? We have 31 Texas senators. Uh, and you know, to, to actually get, a, get a, a sense of how many people they you know, represent, you take that 25 million population that's sort of been thrown out there, and for the 31 senators, you divide it up, and for the 150 House members, you divide it up, and that's how many people they represent. So the Senate districts are really large, uh, and the process works similar on the Senate side regarding the committees that, that, uh, that they go to, uh, but with a little, little, uh, little, little difference. And the, the, the fact of the matter is, over on the Senate side, is that the lieutenant governor, uh, in most states, the lieutenant governor is second to the governor and basically doesn't do much of anything. If the governor gets sick and dies or is incapacitated, then in those states the lieutenant governor becomes the governor. That's not the case in Texas. In Texas, and they run as a ticket usually. They run together. In Texas, it's an independently elected office, uh, the lieutenant governor. And the lieutenant governor has always been held to be the most powerful position in Texas. Uh, because, and it's, it's largely because of his role in the legislative process. He basically selects who the committee chairs are, who again, the process over, the, over on the Senate side works a lot like it does on the House, is that they hear the bills that they want to hear, don't hear the bills that they don't want to hear. That process works the same, but unlike the House, they don't have a calendars committee. And basically it's the lieutenant governor that basically says, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to recognize you, Senator, to hear your bill today, or I'm not going to recognize you. So there's a lot of political posturing, uh, and it all falls under uh, the lieutenant governor. So you have this process in, in, the, in Texas that works, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what this last legislative session held. 
but uh, would also like to have a little discussion about Congress. Does anybody know how many, okay, you have, you have a similar makeup. You have a U.S. House and you have a U.S. Senate. Does anybody know how many U.S. House members we have? 435. There are 435 U.S. House members. Texas has 32 of those. Uh, and actually this past legislative session, the Texas legislature came up with a plan. We actually got four new seats uh, from, from the census that we had a decade ago to this census. Our population grew so fast that we added four seats. The next, larger, the next uh, growing state was Florida and they added two seats. So Texas basically grew a whole lot faster uh, than, than any other state in the country. So we went from having 32 seats to having 36 seats, which tells, you, tells me at least one thing, is that our congressional districts are smaller than our Texas Senate districts. Texas senators represent more constituents than our U.S. congressional members do. So uh, the, the process up there, I won't even talk about the process process up in D.C. and how their process works because they don't typically get anything done uh, in a timely manner. Uh, on the U.S. Senate side, uh, does anybody know how many U.S. Senators we have? We have a hundred. Every state gets two, gets two Senators and we have, so we have a, a hundred total. So very good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Texas, the Texas Legislature. Does anybody know how often the Texas Legislature meets? Every two years. Uh, they, they start the second Tuesday in January in odd numbered years and have a session that runs 140 calendar days. Uh, unfortunately, this legislative session, they couldn't get all their work done during the 140 calendar days, and they had a special session that takes an extra uh, 30 days. Special session has to be called by the governor. Uh, he called one, they got their work done. Hopefully they won't come back for another 480 days, but who's counting? Uh, so let's talk about uh, the Texas legislature. Like I said, the Texas Medical Association represents 45,000 doctors uh, around the state. Um, in our legislative agenda, this session was called Caring for Patients in a Time of Change. And I, I think that uh, you would have to be asleep under a rock uh, not to recognize is that there's a lot of change going on in the healthcare uh, segment. You know, some of them at the local level, a lot of them at the state level, a lot of them at the federal level. And, you know, they're, they're very much, it's like a patchwork. Uh, as you see changes at one level, it's going to end up pushing issues down or pushing issues up. Uh, but again, is that change is inevitable in the healthcare system. This one. Now, this is, a, this is a slide that I'm required to show when I give this talk to the doctor. So I, it basically says I, I don't have any financial interest in giving this presentation, but since uh, I'm not doing that. Um, so what are the objectives that I, that I have when I give this presentation to doctors? You know, there are lots of challenges facing medicine uh, in the healthcare system that's being, uh, that, that is being changed at every level uh, today and in the future. You know, again, is it the one thing that, that absolutely exists is that change is going to be inevitable. And, you know, we need to, you know, from, from my position and the people that I represent, you know, want to make sure that, uh, that whatever the system looks like in the future is that physicians are able to continue to provide care to their patients. Uh, talk a little bit about legislative uh, strategies and then these challenges and what uh, individual physicians can do. You know, Texas, uh, there's one thing that, the, that the legislature, the Texas legislature, is constitutionally mandated to do. Actually, there are two things, but the, the first and foremost uh, that happens every single session is that they've got to pass a budget. The second one uh, is that they are constitutionally mandated to pass a redistricting plan, but that only happens once every decade. It happened this past session, but the state budget is the principal thing that the legislature does. Uh, and I think that if you picked up a paper, you saw that you know, the state of Texas was in you know, dire financial uh, straits. You know, uh, basically, the state's not bringing in enough revenue for the expenses that we have. You know, we have a you know, large uh, health care budget. We have a large education budget. So the legislature came in. You know, basically, the legislature we have has 100, the, the House has 101 Republican House members 
has 19 Republican senators, has a Republican lieutenant governor, has a Republican speaker, has a Republican governor. And I, b before they even started, uh, I think that there was consensus amongst those individuals, we're not going to increase taxes to, uh, to, to make the state uh, balance its budget. We're gonna look at the services that we provide, you know, try and really get down to the core services that the state provides and come up with a, come up with a budget that doesn't, have tax, that doesn't have a tax increase. So the initial budget, uh, Texas has a biennial budget that runs in the neighborhood of about $180 billion. You know, so they were looking at uh, a $32 billion hole and how to fill it. Well, the initial, the, the House passed the budget that, that cut pay, Medicaid payments to physicians, hospitals, nursing homes uh, by 10%, uh, deep cuts to CHIP, trauma funding, mental health, uh, number of public health programs, big cuts to medical schools, GME, primary care residencies, and then uh, it also eliminated the physician loan repayment program. Uh, the physician loan repayment program was actually passed last session and really was, benefit, was a benefit to rural counties in the state, which are having a hard time getting doctors to come out to those communities, largely, as Lee showed, because of issues, payer mix, uh, you know, 70 plus percent of, of the, the, the patients that, that doctors in this area see are gonna be Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of commercial insurance, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes difficult pop population to serve, and most of the doctors coming out of their residencies have $200,000 plus in loans. Uh, so it creates a challenge in coming out, to, coming out to rural communities. And my parents live in Comanche County now. They, I grew up out in Pecos, Texas, out in Reeves County, but they had the same problem there. You know, the, the, nothing against the doctors in this county, but the doctors you know, in these counties are getting older, you know, and, and it's sort of a, a cycle is at some point in time, gonna have to replace the doctors that you have with new doctors uh, or figure out a different way to provide services. The Senate, uh, as the Senate is prone to do, is a little bit more uh, gracious with the dollars and, and you know, they, they didn't cut spending as bad as the House. They didn't cut physician uh, payments in the Medicaid system. Uh, they did cut hospital payments. Um, they didn't cut mental health funding uh, or so a lot of the public health programs. You know, and, and, and mental health programs are, are, are a perfect example. You know, if the state doesn't fund mental health uh, services, those patients end up getting care in the system. They get care through the emergency room, they get care through the prison system, they get care somewhere. Uh, so, you know, I think the legislature in a lot of the conversations, you know, tried to uh, reflect on the fact that they didn't want to be penny wise and pound foolish and end up costing the system in some other place. Uh, and then it also allotted more money than the House budget did for graduate medical education. It did continue the loan repayment program and other workforce because I think physician training has been mentioned. Uh, you know, there are, are a number of other healthcare uh, professionals that the state puts a lot of money into those programs. You know, nursing, uh, physical therapy, uh, a, a whole lot of other uh, related programs. The adopted budget, sort of, I guess they took the best of both plans, which neither one of them were good overall because they, were, they had significant cuts to them. But the, the plan that was adopted didn't have any cuts to uh, Medicaid or CHIP payments, no, no cuts in state mental health funding, and then no cuts in, in these uh, public programs. However, that $15 billion that I did mention came from somewhere. So these are some of the areas that saw significant cuts. Uh, the higher education budgets were, were cut pretty drastically and medical education, uh, graduate medical education was cut. Uh, family practice residency programs were cut by nearly 75%. Uh, the statewide primary care preceptorship program, which basically gets uh, medical students interested in, prim in primary care, uh, was not funded. Uh, the GME formula, it's basically a per unit, um, per unit cost per physician, it was cut significantly, and then the loan repayment program, the Medicaid one was eliminated, the, the other one was cut by basically three-fourths, um, which again, the legislature and the population is not likely to see the impact of these types of cuts, they're not going to see it next year, they're likely not going to see it the year after that. The, the training programs for 
uh, physicians, you know, they don't take, it's not a two-year budget cycle for them. Is that those programs, those kids are in medical school for four years, uh, then they go and do their residency, which is basically the area of specialty that they want to focus on. They do that for three years. So you're, you're looking out and, you know, what we're certainly concerned about is that they're crimping the pipeline of physicians for the future. Uh, and, and again, the, you know, the challenge is, is if, you're, if you're going into this uh, legislative session saying we're not going to raise taxes, we're not going to change the tax system, and you're going to have to cut services, uh, you can, the legislators can talk all they want, but there really only are a couple of areas that receive the mass majority of general revenue funding in the state of Texas. Actually two. That's education and health care. You know, that's 90% of where they spend the general revenue budget. You know, in education, it's public and higher, and, and then healthcare. You know, and, and most of the cuts were absorbed by those three areas. So that $15 billion, those cuts came from one of those three areas, the vast majority of them. Uh, we have a place on our, our, on our website to sort of look at, you know, where you can get information relating to the Texas legislature. Uh, wanted to talk about a couple of issues. We track about 7,500 bills during that 140 days that I talk about which tells you one thing is that legislators are filing way too many bills. Um, but we, we track about 2,500 of them deal specifically with some segment of the, of the health care uh, industry. You know, either it's public health or it's funding or it's a scope of practice or it's employment. Um, you know, I think that employment and, and I come from, my background is really hospital administration. And I worked for the Texas Hospital Association back in 2003 when we passed medical liability reform that Dr. Buxton mentioned. Uh, you know, we have, had, we have been at odds with the hospital association over the last couple of sessions over the issue of, it, of hospital employment. And for us, uh, hospital employment this sort of breaks down this way, is that we want to make sure that the physicians, when they're caring for their patients, that they're not subject to outside corporate influence directing them in how to provide services to their patients. Uh, the bills that were passed, and they, they, are specific, they will specifically benefit you know, the, the, the counties, these, the three counties here and rural counties throughout the state, but really was trying to give them uh, the ability to bring in physicians because again, the difficulties in bringing physicians in, uh, but we also want to make sure that there are strong protections for the physicians uh, relating to clinical autonomy, that they're including, you know, most, most of these counties have ex some exi existing medical infrastructure. They have physicians that are providing services. Want to make sure that the hospital is working with those physicians provi to provide services in the future. Uh, and want to make sure that the doctor is able to exercise independent medical judgment on behalf of their patient and not being told, well, you need to do these tests on this, this patient because we need this revenue or you need to get this patient out of the hospital because you know, we're not being paid anymore for the services that they're receiving or so on and so on. Not saying that that happens, uh, you know, but I think that there is certainly the possibility of those things happening. You know, I, as I told my colleagues at the hospitals, you know, it is a symbiotic relationship between the doctors and the hospitals is that they need to be working together to provide the best possible care for the patient. Again, the, the, the physician's responsibility ultimately should be to that patient and what's best for that patient. And we are, you know, there are a lot of states that have exceptions for hospitals, and we're, we are the first state in the, in the country to have specific statutory language relating to protecting the physician's clinical judgment. There was also a piece of legislation, and uh, Dr. Watson mentioned it as the accountable care organization. Well, if you mention accountable care organizations in the Texas legislature, that it would ensure that the bill would be dead uh, because accountable care organizations came out of a democratically controlled Congress and like I mentioned is all of the members of, of most of the members in the Texas legislature are Republican. Uh, so we call them collaboratives. Um, so different, it's, a, it's amazing what a difference a word can make in a political process. Uh, but sort of that same the continuation of the discussion relating to employment is that wanted to make sure as these collaboratives were developed is that physicians were able to focus on the clinical side of care that's being provided to patients. And if these collaboratives are, are taking money and deciding how money is distributed, 
uh, in, in these systems is that physicians should have a voice in determining how those funds are distributed, you know, how care is provided because the, as, as Lee talked about, you know, the money flowing through the system, it relates at the end of the day in how care is provided. And either through incentives or disincentives, uh, the money will, you know, you just have to follow the money to determine how the process works. Uh, you know, what we wanted to make sure for the physician is that the physician, you know, was able to participate in more than one collaborative. So it, it really doesn't impact rural uh, as much as it does urban settings, but because in a rural setting, you basically got one, one uh, horse in town. And so either you're going to ride on that horse or you're not going to have a horse to ride on. Uh, you know, in urban settings, you have these big systems. And what we wanted to make sure didn't happen is that, you know, we still want to retain the ability of the doc to do what's best for the patient. And if, you know, if the doc felt like the best care is, might be provided outside of that system, we want to make sure that he has some ability, he or she has some ability uh, to refer that patient where they need to get the care. This is just a number of, uh, we passed probably six bills on the employment side, and I won't go through all of them. Again, as I'll, I will tell you is that uh, most of the rural areas in the state, if you had a uh, either, uh, count, it's basically counties less than 50,000, then you're able to go through this mechanism of employing docs. You have to meet criteria for doing that, but you're able to employ docs. And, and actually there are several uh, counties that I'm aware of that have gone through have gone through the process. You know they've involved their medical staff. They've identi identified a local physician to to help work with the hospital to develop these. And and again, is that the medical staff ultimately is responsible for the clinical decisions um, in those settings. You know what we like to say is that really employment without protections is the corporate practice of medicine, and we are uh, the medical association is adamantly opposed to the corporate practice of medicine. Because, at the, at, again, and I, I, I say it again and again and again, I do the same thing with the doctors, but for the, for the doctors and for the patients, that, that is where ultimately the decisions relating to their health care need to be made. Uh, we want to try and make, make sure that corporate influence does not drive the decisions of the doctors. So employment with protections is part of what the, the practice of medicine is, and that's what we stand for. And I think that we're going to continue to see an evolution on this, this side and a continuing push, you know, both from the hospital end as well as from the physician end. Uh, we've, we've seen our uh, new graduates coming out of the, their residency programs looking at employment options, wanting to consider employment options. And, and again, it's, it's for those doctors, whether or not they think about it at that point in time when they're looking at signing a contract, we want to make sure that if they do sign a contract, that they continue to represent their patients um, relating to the care that they receive. Another issue that consumed a lot of my time this last legislation is the medical board. And Dr. Buxton again mentioned medical liability. Uh, when we basically passed the reforms back in 2003, the trade-off that we had is that we wanted to make sure that we had a strong medical board. Because if patients that are, have been injured, you know, whether or not uh, the, the the doctor did it deliberately or, or the doctor did it, they need to have a mechanism for seeking redress. Um, and the mechanism that, that we supported is that we want to make sure that we have a strong medical board, that if we do have physicians that have quality of care issues, that the patients can, can make sure that, uh, that, that, they get, that they get the medical board to take action against that, against that physician and make sure that that physician either provides better care in the future or that that physician doesn't practice in the state of Texas in the future. And so that's really what the medical board was responsible for doing, and we made a number of changes in that area. Uh, on the health insurance uh, market side is that there are a lot of changes in the Affordable Care Act at the federal level that you know, basically consumed six years of my life at the state level. They passed at the federal level, uh, so, you know, in Texas, we're not really working on them right now. But there were, uh, there were a couple of issues. Uh, the first one is uh, dis what are called discretionary clauses. You know, basically, the, uh, the insurance companies would put in a lot of their contracts basically saying, at the end of the day, we reserve the right to determine if it's a covered benefit or not a co covered benefit. Uh, as, you can, as you might guess, is that uh, they were saying that there were a lot of not covered benefits and they were either having the doctor or the patient eat the cost of the care that they received. 
Well, basically, uh, this law basically says you can't do that. Is that you can't have a discretionary clause in your contract, uh, and you have to basically tell people up front if it's a covered benefit or not. Um, the second one related to oral chemo drugs basically says if you have, as part of your benefit package, the offering of chemotherapy for patients, you have to offer, uh, if there is a similar oral medication that would be available to the patient, you have to offer that as well. And then, uh, it, it, again, this is a continual problem that we have is uh, physician writes a prescription medication, ends up getting substituted, you know, oftentimes without the physician's knowledge. Uh, you know, and, and some of these drugs that are substituted are basically the same, and I think that that's good. Some of them are not the same. And, you know, again, is that, you know, we want to make sure that what the doctor's prescribing is what, uh, if they believe that it's medically necessary that the patient take that drug, that's what the patient ends up taking. Uh, so we tried, we worked at strengthening the laws um, uh, in, that, in that area. And again, uh, I, I will tell you is that for all of the issues that we face, is that uh, really it's not a destination for the doctors. It's a journey because the issues that we face in the, in the Texas legislature and even in Congress, they're the issues we faced two years ago and four years ago and six years ago and eight years ago and you know, probably going back 20 years ago, is that the, the, the complexity of the healthcare system has changed, which makes uh, certainly this legislative session more difficult than the previous one but the issues really do not. I want to talk a little bit about public health because I, I think that that's important too. Uh, it, as I had mentioned, uh, that was one of the areas that, that you know, the legislature was contemplating cuts. They did make some uh, cuts. There were also some other good single shot pieces of legislation that passed. Uh, first and foremost was uh, immunization bill, is that uh, we have had a lot of problems with meningitis on college campuses. You know, basically the, the legislation that was passed will require college students to get a meningitis shot. It, uh, I mean, once you get a shot, basically you're not gonna, you don't get meningitis. Uh, I mean, it is a very effective public health deal. Uh, the second one is requiring uh, healthcare facilities to have a vaccination policy. Um, you know, we have a lot of patients that are coming into hospitals and other healthcare facilities that have, um, that get infections or whatever at the hospital, uh, and oftentimes it, it's the staff that ends up giving them uh, those things. And, and, and so again, is that we're not saying what the policy has to be, we're just saying that they have to have a policy so that you as a consumer, if you go to your hospital, you at least have, have an idea that, okay, I'm. I'm likely not gonna get the flu from my nurse who's providing care to me or from my doctor who's providing care because the hospital has a vaccination policy that requires them to get uh, vaccinated. Uh, the statewide smoking ban made progress, you know, in a Republican legislature where uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a large push not to have the state solve your problems, but let's, you know, let local government solve their problems. Uh, you know, the smoking ban made progress you know, it's a statewide smoking ban. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but uh, you know, secondhand smoke is a contributor to cancer. Uh, and the doctors on the science side feel very strongly that if we had a statewide smoking ban is that our health outcomes would improve. And most of the states that have statewide smoking bans have borne out just that result. Uh, so the doctors continue to push it. Legislature really not interested in it. They're, you know, they're interested in, in local control. So I would doubt that you know, we will see that type of legislation passed in you know, the foreseeable future unless we change the tactics in what we're trying to accomplish. CPRIP, which is, our, um, which is actually a funding program for cancer research in the state of Texas, uh, was fully funded. You know, and it's one of the things, if you watch any of the debates that, uh, that the Republicans have had, you know, this is one of the areas that uh, Governor Perry has mentioned uh, before in the debates. You know, and I, I think that he is right is that it holds a lot of promise uh, relating to uh, the treatment of cancers in the future. And I think that, you know, Texas is going to be an innovator state and attract a lot of research dollars uh, specifically because uh, this program has been funded and passed in the past and has continued to be funded. Uh, we passed a a concussion bill, which is this uh, young athlete brain injury, 
you know, it, it happened when my dad was a football coach is that a person has a concussion, gets pulled out. You know, uh, my dad never did it, did it, but there are some coaches in the state that will do anything to win. Uh, you say, you know, got to put that kid back in because he's my best running back. Uh, you know, now there is a process that's going to be in place that school that basically takes the authority away from the, the football coach and basically requires that kid, and it's not only football, you know, it happens in every other sport that's out there, but it requires uh, uh, basically a medical team to do an assessment and clear the kid before the kid gets back out on the field, which I, I think is a really good thing. And then finally, uh, you know, when we talk about local control, you know, one of the things I had in school when I was a kid is PE. You know, heck, now they don't have PE. Uh, but they do have a requirement up to ninth grade, and, you know, they were talking about stripping out any sort of exercise in public schools. You know, and, and again, as I think that the obesity epidemic has already been mentioned, you know, and, and this is one of the, the ways that hopefully we can combat or at least educate kids on what they need to be doing uh, in order not to uh, continue this uh, downward cycle that we have relating to obesity. Again, you know, here's uh, sort of our highlights of the legislature. Uh, I, I did also want to mention sort of at the federal level and the, the, the program uh, that was mentioned earlier relating to the Medicare, uh, it's called the Sustainable Growth Rate. It's the payment model for physicians in the Medicare program. And as you saw from Lee's slide is that you have a large Medicare population in the three counties that are, are represented here today. Uh, and at the end of the year, physicians are slated to get a 30% cut in Medicare. And really over the last decade, physicians basically have gotten, they're getting paid the same that they got paid a decade ago in the Medicare system. You know, and, and it, again, not, not picking on the hospitals, but using the hospitals as a reference point. You know, hospitals have gotten an economic update that reflects the cost of providing the service in each, each of those years. And the same thing with skilled nursing facilities and the same thing with a number of other Medicare providers so that the gap between physicians and other providers is about 25% right now. And, you know, it, it, it will be, if, if you see a 30% cut, I think you will definitely see a, ch a change in physicians' ability to take Medicare uh, because we see it on the Medicaid side. Is I think that most physicians, you know, want to, want to serve the population of the community that they're in, but if you're losing money, you can't make it on an individual, you're not gonna make it up in volume. Uh, and I think that's one of the challenges that we have with Medicaid, is that Medicaid doesn't pay the cost of providing the services, not on the primary care side, not on the specialty care side. The, the, the federal government has done some things to address the Medicaid uh, funding for primary care docs, but they haven't done anything on the specialty docs. And, you know, really, I, I do think that the medical home sort of rely, relies upon uh, the pr a primary care practice coordinating care for those individual patients. But that's not to say that the specialty docs aren't equally as important in providing services to the patient as well. Is you know, a general surgeon doing surgery on a patient, maybe need an orthopedic surgeon, you know, neurologist, allergist, dermatologist. You can go down the line to the, all the ologists and, you know, patients need care from those individuals too. And, you know, I, I'm worried that the system that we're creating, you know, if it's a publicly funded system, it's an inadequately funded public system. Uh, you know, and, and one of, and all, of all the discussions that they have uh, relating to the healthcare system, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw it out because, again, I'm a lobbyist, that's what I do. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the payment side on providers, you know, but it is an equation, as Dr. Watson showed. The other portion of it is benefits, uh, you know, and what's going to be done with benefits. And as we have more people that are going on the Medicare rolls with the baby boomers, uh, you know, what Congress has done thus far is really focused on the payment side to providers, and in particular, physicians. Uh, but at some point in time, whether or not it's tomorrow, or a year from now, or a decade from now, they're going to have to focus on the benefit side as well. And we see some of those issues in the Texas legislature. End of life. You know, are we effectively spending money on care at the end of a person's life? Because, you know, like everybody else in the room, uh, and unless there's an intervention, uh, all of us are going to die at some point in time. It's part of the living process. 
And so, you know, trying to have these conversations, I think, with the general public is difficult. You know, trying to have them with the legislature is very difficult because it is a third rail of politics, you know, particularly at the federal level. If you tar start talking about cutting Medicare benefits, you know, cutting Social Security, you know, you do so at your own risk and political peril. Uh, but again, is that it's the challenge that we have. Um, I look forward. I, I certainly commend the group for getting together because I think that, you know, in order to make changes for the health care system, which are coming, you know, it, it's going to take groups like this around the state and around the country to, to be able to truly impact the health care system for the future. And, and again, we've got to have these discussions. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.